Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Northport. We're glad to have you worshiping with us on this day, on this Lord's Day. We're glad to have you, if you're visiting with us and haven't worshiped with us before, we welcome you. We hope that even though we are not together worshiping in the sanctuary, you will feel some of the warmth and love that is present in this worship service this day. I have a couple of announcements, as those of you know who follow the calendar. Today is the last day in the month of January. I know it hardly seems possible, but we're one month in to the new year. And what that means is that if we still have outstanding pledges for 2021, we would really ask you to get that pledge into the office for 2021 so that our finance committee might finalize our budget and present it to our session during the month of February. That would be a great help to us. You can pledge online by going to pledge at fpcnorthport.org, or you can call Kevin McCurr at the church office, or you can go online and make your, your pledge through Realm. So those it's very easy to do, and we would really invite you to do so if you have not. Thank you to all who have pledged. We are 80% toward our goal for 2021, so we are getting there. And again, the good thing about 2021 is that we don't have any debt. We've retired our mortgage, so we are in good fiscal shape, but we are counting on these outstanding pledges to come in. So thank you, and we appreciate your benevolence and we appreciate your generosity. We have a new members class coming up this coming Wednesday via Zoom. You should have gotten the Zoom link by now in an email. If you or someone you know is interested in membership here or finding out more about the church, please ask them to email or to call the church office if they have not already done so. Anyone that signed up for the new members class should have received an email with some information this week from our office. So if you did not receive that and you're interested in worship, please, in, in joining our church and in, in new members, please join, please email the office. And the new members will join next Sunday, February 7th. Thank you for that. And now lean in to worship and lean back on the everlasting arms of God. Come and praise God in the company of God's people. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great are the works of God, full of glory and majesty. Our God is gracious and compassionate. Our God is merciful and forgiving. Our God is faithful and trustworthy. Our God is just and good. So come, come, let us worship God together. God's praise will last forever. Scripture tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
in humility and with faith. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Although our Lord Jesus Christ comes among us to bring us peace, we are a people divided. Sometimes our divisions is with others and we harbor fears and jealousies against our neighbor. Sometimes we are divided within our being, thinking too little or too much about ourselves. Sometimes we are divided from you, forgetting your presence and your grace to us in Christ. Lord, have mercy upon us. Bring us your healing peace so that we can serve you in this world as agents of your reconciling love. Friends, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is over. The new life in Christ has begun. Friends, hear and believe this very good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled sinners, we pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hello, my young friends. I am so glad to be with you. I would invite you to gather around wherever you are in your homes, your living rooms, your bedroom, wherever you are today, and gather around for our time together. I hope you're all doing well and staying warm and doing well in school, and I miss you, but I'm glad to be able to have this time with you today. So one of the things I really like to do is play games. And one of my favorite games is a game called Apples to Apples. Now maybe some of you have played this game or played with your families. We play this game a lot with our youth group here at First Press, and we play it a lot at home also. But do you know that there are rules to playing every game? So these are the rules for apples to apples. And you're supposed to read the rules before you play the game so that you know how to play the game. But who do you think makes up the rules for the game? Whose idea do you think it is to come up with that? It's the person who invented the game, right? The person who came up with the game comes up with the rules. The one who created the game makes, makes the rules for the enjoyment of all who play the game. And if someone doesn't follow the rules, which I'm sure none of you would ever do, and I certainly would never do that, but if you don't follow those rules, it takes away from the enjoyment of the game. So have you ever played a game with somebody that didn't follow the rules or maybe tried to skimp on the rules a little bit? I know I have. There are rules that we must follow in the game of life too. The rule book for the game of life is the Bible. And the Bible has some rules and some advice for us and things that we should follow. So who do you think wrote those rules? Right, it was God. Remember how I tell you that every answer is either God or Jesus. So either one you would have been right. So God wrote the Bible and gave us the rule book so that we might live life and enjoy life to the fullest. So one day in our scripture today, Jesus went into a temple and he started teaching. And the Bible tells us that people who heard him were amazed at his teaching. He didn't sound like a regular teacher. He didn't sound like someone who knew about the rules. He sounded like someone who had written the rules. Well, guess what? He did write the rules. Jesus was God in human form who came to, to earth to teach us how to live. God made the rules and God shows us how to follow the rules. And he wants us to follow the rules so that we can enjoy life the way God intended for us to enjoy it. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for teaching us how to live. Help us to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ in all we say and do. Amen. Reading from Psalm 111, verse 1 to 5 and 9 and 10. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. 
The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson today is from Mark's gospel, and it's chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. So this takes place after Jesus, who was possessed by the Holy Spirit and fresh from successfully confronting Satan in the wilderness and preaching the reign of God, and he's now in the company of at least four followers. And it's time for Jesus' public ministry to gather momentum. The scene is in Capernaum, which is a town northwest on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it's in a synagogue, a setting of prayer and teaching and worship. And people are coming together and they are asking, why does Jesus do what he, do, what he does? For whom does he speak and act? Who have, has authorized his ministry? Listen now for God's living word to us from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we have come to this worship service to hear your teaching, your teaching with authority, not authority that we know, but your authority that only you have. May each of us this day, O oh God, hear exactly what you would have us hear. And to that end, O oh God, pour through me this day the gift of preaching, that by a miracle of your grace, these words might be transformed from my human word into your living word to each and every person who hears them. And we know you will, O oh God, for we pray with great anticipation. In the strong name of Jesus, the risen and the reigning Christ, amen. Many of you watched the presidential inauguration last week. And if you did, one of the things that you might have seen or might have since seen is former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders sitting on a folding chair with his arms crossed in his lap, sitting there casually as if he were at some ball game or some casual event, and he had on a pair of knit mittens clueless to the fact that anybody was even tuning in or looking at what he was wearing when he was sitting there in his folding chair. And since the memes that have come about have been hilarious. Maybe you have seen some of them. There's one meme of Bernie Sanders sitting at the Last Supper next to Jesus and the disciples with Bernie's mittens on. Now I know that that's a stretch and maybe some of you are offended by it, but look at it, it actually is pretty funny. And what is, what is even funnier is some of the other places that Bernie Sanders has turned up. He's turned up in family photos. He's turned up in meetings of corporate executives. 
he's turned up in church pews sitting by himself. But in one of the memes, he's sitting underneath a sign that says, and these are, these are the words from ben Benjamin Franklin, it is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority. Questioning authority is something that we've heard a lot about, a lot about recently. And Bernie Sanders used to talk about it a lot during his campaign. Some ask the question, whatever happened to authority? We hear about the breakdown in authority at every turn, from the home to the halls of politics, from the classrooms to the office of the pope. Whatever happened to authority? We take that question back to Capernaum, back to today's reading from the Gospel of Mark. Mark says, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Why did people sense authority in Jesus' presence? How did they recognize his authority and what was so compelling about it? It was his teaching. He taught as one who had authority. So normally I would tell you to sit back and to put your bulletin in the pew rack and pay attention, but since you're not in church right now, I'm gonna tell you to go and get a cup of coffee, turn the volume on your computer or your television set up a bit, and then we'll listen. What is this teaching that so astonished Jesus' hearers? Well, we don't know. Not a word of Jesus' teaching is remembered here at Capernaum. Whatever it was that so astonished people was not written down for us to hear. You may rightly protest that Jesus' teaching is remembered in other places, and in some Bibles, some of you maybe have a Bible like this, everything that Jesus said is printed in red. Yet it's rather odd that in Mark's Gospel, where Jesus is called teacher over and over again by disciples, by the crowd, by the Pharisees, very few of Jesus' teachings are remembered. In Mark, there's no Sermon on the Mount, as in Matthew, nor will you find many of Luke's parables, and we will never know what Jesus taught here at the synagogue in Capernaum. We only know how he taught, as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And that too is rather odd, for authority seems to be precisely what the scribes did have. They could claim the authority of written words passed down through many, many generations. They had the, the authority of tradition, a kind of laying on of hands from the time of Moses. They had the prestige of religious leadership, the authority of clerical position and power. But somehow, somehow Jesus taught with authority, surpassing all these claims, somehow more compelling, more authentic to those who heard him. So what sort of authority was this? We keep listening, keep hoping that Mark's gospel will reveal the answer, and then suddenly we're interrupted by a madman. Right in the middle of the service, perhaps even in the middle of the sermon, we hear a wild voice, disruptive, disjointed, and crazy. Where were the ushers? Who let this man in? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? His shouting drowns out the preacher. Have you come to destroy us? Us, we look around. There is only one man shouting, clearly schizophrenic, multiple personality disorder. I know who you are, the man says. You are the Holy One of God. And now the preacher comes down from the pulpit, departing from whatever text he had, and confronts the man, or rather the voice. Be silent 
and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, crying with a loud voice, came out of the man. Is that what we're left with then? Evidence that Jesus' authority was recognized by a crazy man? Can we trust the witness of unclean spirits who acknowledge Jesus to be the Holy One of God? Oh, we had hoped for something more. Yet over and over again in Mark's Gospel, it is the demons who know who Jesus is. Those who were crazy called him the Holy One. Those who were sane put him to death. And when Jesus died, it was the centurion soldier, an outsider, who proclaimed, truly, this was the Son of God. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus himself is the content of the teaching. The authority is not in particular speeches, but in this particular life. Jesus lived as one who had authority, an authority radically different from that of tradition, different from what had been expected. To understand this authority, we must not only listen, we must also look. We see Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. We see Jesus healing on the Sabbath day, silencing the scribe's objection, not with an answer, but with a question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? We see Jesus moved by the feisty faith of the Syrophoenician woman who dared to argue with him for the healing of her daughter. We hear questions as a source of truth, and we hear Jesus admit the limits of his own knowledge. When Jesus spoke about the end of time, these were the words he said. Of that day, or of that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only God. At the end of his life, brought before the council of religious elders and the power of the state, Jesus' authority stands in silence. And Pilate asked him again, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate wondered. Though pushed to get rid of Jesus, Pilate could not get Jesus out of his mind. Even in silence, Jesus taught as one who had authority. It is this radically different kind of authority which compels us to re-examine what authority means for us, to look carefully at how authority functions, especially within the church. Jesus did not give us a systematic guidebook on authority. But in Jesus' life, we have seen and heard clues of how his authority was made known in the world. The people in Capernaum were amazed so that they questioned among themselves, what is this, a new teaching? Now the question they should have asked is not what, but who. Jesus is a who. When we hear and see this new teaching, we will be moved, if not toward clear answers, at least in certain clear directions. The authority of Jesus moves us toward inclusion rather than exclusion. More specifically, this authority includes precisely persons who had been excluded before. It is what liberation theologians call an authority from below. Those invited into Jesus' rabbinic school included tax collectors and sinners, poor widows and prostitutes, little children as models of the reign of God, and foreigners as models of faith. We must therefore be suspicious of religious or political authority which moves toward exclusion 
whose aim is to keep certain people out by written rule or daily practice. We must judge ourselves and our churches by Jesus' move toward inclusion. Jesus' authority also values people over rules or traditions. We see and hear this person-centered morality at every turn, but most clearly we see it in Jesus' arguments with the religious leaders over the Sabbath laws and other written traditions. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to save a life or kill? At another point, Jesus turned to the leaders and said, you are making void the word of God through your tradition, which you hand on. Does Jesus turn, us, turn to us with the same accusation? In our longing for greater certainty and clearer religious authority, it is often people who suffer. In order to shore up the tradition, we devalue precious women, men, and children. And we must judge ourselves and our churches by Jesus' insistence in valuing people more than laws. And we must, must judge ourselves and our churches and our politics by Jesus' acknowledgement of human lim limitation. You and I long, especially now, for absolutes. But Jesus' authority was marked by admitting that there were some things even he did not know. Only God knows. Theologian and poet Gerhard Frost tried to open up the possibility of this different kind of authority in his poem, Loose Leaf. Here's what he had to say. When your options are either to revise your beliefs or to reject a person, look again. Any formula for living that is too cramped for the human situation cries for rethinking. Hardcover catechisms are a contradiction to our loose leaf lives. So we long for things to be clearer we feel threatened when there seems to be two or more possible right answers. We would rather check true or false, yes or no. But Jesus stands with us in the midst of our loose leaf lives, promising to be present with us as we struggle together for faithful answers at this time of human history. If we can acknowledge that our human understanding is not the same as God's, we may come to believe that the spirit which, which dwelt with Jesus will lead us into truth which has yet to be revealed. Jesus' Jesus's authority cannot be contained to a campaign slogan or a meme. It cannot be reduced to a slogan or a tract or a bumper sticker. Nor is Jesus' authority a word to hurl at our opponents. Jesus is the content of his teaching, and we must pay attention to his whole life and listen even to his silence. Perhaps then we will stand with the outsider at the foot of the cross and confess, truly, truly, this is the Son of God. In this beloved one, I I will put all my trust. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us now affirm what we believe using the words printed in your bulletin. We believe there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. We know that all things God works for good together with those who love God, who are called according to God's purposes. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are one month in to this new year and many of us already feel like it's been a whole year. We have seen the increases in deaths due to COVID-19. We've seen violence. We've seen anxiety of increased violence weighed on our hearts. We see things that we thought maybe would be gone by now or done by now, and yet they continue. We pray, O oh God, that you would give us rest Breathe into us your Holy Spirit. May it energize us, rejuvenate us, and make us agents of your love and peace. We pray for the leaders of our country and of our world. We pray that you would guide their choices and help them to lead with empathy, compassion, and grace. We ask, O oh God, that you would make us instruments of your peace make us repairers of breaches. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, until the poor are lifted, the sick are healed, children are protected, and civil rights and human rights never neglected. Grant us wisdom, O God, for the facing of this hour, until love and justice are never rejected. We know, O oh God, that you teach us with authority. You teach us by your words in Holy Scripture, and you teach us by giving, giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us not only with words, but also with his life. We know, O oh God, that the temperatures are cold. We pray for all of those who don't have shelter or a warm place to live or a warm meal. Be with all of us and help us to know how to reach out in love and compassion to your children in need. Grant us wisdom and courage for the facing of this hour. Together we will make sure that there will be justice. Help us to reach out. Help us to work for peace and justice and to care for the planet that you have given us. We pray all of these things, both spoken and unspoken, in the one prayer you taught every one of us who would be your disciple, to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, Jesus taught in the synagogue as one who had authority, and his followers said, what is this? But the question they should ask, and we should ask, is who is this? It's Jesus who teaches us with authority and teaches us ways to live our loose-leaved lives. And now as we go, may God's grace, mercy, and peace from the God we know as creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all be with us and flowing through us this day and every day. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.